Hi everyone. I think we can start now. All attendees are here. And welcome to our session today. What happened in the email industry this year? Um, I'm really looking forward to this session today because our speakers today are Sebastian and Alexandra. And maybe you know my name or not. My name is Maike and I'm responsible for all the marketing and event stuff at the CSA. And what we do or what we have seen this year or experienced this year, all the things uh, we'll share uh, Alexandra and Sebastian with you later. I just wanna give you a brief overview to the housekeeping rules for today. Please note that you're new to doing the world webinar. Um, you can ask your questions at the end in the, at the Q&A session. And today you have two options you can use to ask your questions. The first one is you can use the chat function. It might be on the right on your screen and you can ask your questions via the chat and we will read the questions out loud at the end. Or the second option is that you can ask your question um, live at the end. Of course, we would be happy if you use this function so we can share your question and um, answer them live, of course. And um, I think that's that's it from, for me now. And I would like to give the moderation rights to Alexandra who starts the presentation. And um, yeah, you will hear me and see me at the end of the session again. So I think you can. Let's get. Hello, everybody. Just give me a second to start my presentation, or let's better say our presentation. But before we start, uh, welcome from my side as well. Um, unfortunately, it's just about a virtual meeting and not a face to face meeting this year, but I'm really looking forward to the session and the next meeting we have face to face to just share our experience and yeah, have all the, the um, real good talks we had in the past. So coming to the legal overview of this year, just give me a second. We prepared four topics for you today to discuss and yeah, to present you the issues we determined this year from a legal perspective, um, looking at the questions you raised over the year, but also looking at the issues we determined when uh, dealing with the reports we received, unfortunately. So as you can see, it's about uh, gambling, or at least um, emails promoting gambling. It's about data transfer to the US ESPs. It's about transactional emails and missing permission data. Let's start with the gambling stuff. So um, now it's working. Um, looking at the last, let's, uh, we can say one and a half, two years, advertisement for online gaming was always an issue. And a lot of companies really were waiting for the new interstate treaty on gambling in Germany because they really thought, okay, it's about a good new situation, we can have limitless gambling advertisement and all the issues and problems we had in the past will be gone with this new interstate treaty. So let's have a look at it. The interstate treaty entered into force on July 1st this year. And um, the first thing I have to mention here, things changed, of course, but in regards to advertisement of gambling, um, it's not the big shift we had. So the first really important information is online gambling is allowed now in Germany, all over Germany, not only in a specific federal state. But uh, the bad news for the online gambling industry and also for the advertisement of uh, gambling is you need to have a license for online gambling. And this license is granted by a so-called joint gambling authority. And if you have this license, you're mentioned on a so-called white list, which can be found on a specific website at the federal state of um, Saxony something. Unfortunately, I have not the translation in my mind right now. Um, you can see it on the screen. There is a link where you can find all the already licensed online gambling services. 
if this license is granted, you're also allowed to send emails advertising online gambling. gambling. But it's really only about this um, situation. And I really have to mention that looking at the discussions we had over the last month, we really expected a lot of companies just asking for this license, but um, it's just a few lotteries and betting services who already applied for this license and who were granted with that um, in regards to the pure online gambling stuff. Until November 6th, there was no license granted. And another important point here is uh, to mention that betting on lotteries, which is about, okay, who will win the next lottery, which will be the numbers um, who will win or something like that, is still prohibited. So no change here. And if you have customers who want to send emails in this area, I really can recommend um, yeah, that the customers have a good look and a good assessment whether they are just um, sending advertisement for a lottery or if they are betting on lotteries. And if you have customers sending online gambling advertisements, just make them aware they need the license. And if you really want to check that the license has already been granted, have a look at the web page that's mentioned on the screen. I think we can share the link afterwards too. The second important topic of this year was the data transfer to ESPs who were located in the US. The reason for that is um, from a European perspective, if you want to share data with uh, or companies, service providers outside the European Union, you really have to make sure that you have almost the same level of data protection in the receiving country as it is laid down in the GDPR. And the US situation was of specific um, relevance last year because we have um, a so-called TRAMS 2 verdict of the Court of Justice. And afterwards, we had um, the Data Protection Authority of the Federal State of Bavaria who just uh, said, OK, it's not OK to just forward personal data to US-based ESPs. The reason for that is, before we have the so-called TRAMS 2 verdict, um, it was really fine that you transfer data to US companies based on the privacy shield and the old model clauses. But due to this verdict, um, the reason was, or the, the outcome was that the privacy shield is not sufficient and the old model clauses are not sufficient too to make sure that the same data protection level is um, really in place. So you really needed to have uh, waiting up the interest of the, in the cases, um, which includes, of course, the old model clauses, but um, more particular requires a dedicated security measures assessment and to implement specific measures, such as uh, encryption rules regarding data access for authorities and all that things. And this was a very complex and complicated situation. After this verdict, um, the Commission developed new model clauses. That's the good news here. And instead of two specific modules, you now have four modules, which means that for a much better situation, a more granular uh, assessment, you can now choose the right um, framework that is applying for you. That's the good news. The more bad news is uh, that the list of duties has been extended in this new model clauses, which on the other hand really allows now for relying on this model clauses and makes it easier for you to transfer the data to the ESPs in the US. And which is also of relevance, the duty to inform in case of any data access by authority is now already covered. So it's much easier for you to make sure that the data protection level is almost the same as it is in the European Union. Anyways, we really recommend that you still make a kind of risk assessment um, for two reasons. The first reason is only with a proper risk assessment, you can choose which 
model class uh, module is the right one for you. And we really recommend to make a, at least a very short documentation on this risk assessment because if another data protection authority is thinking that something is not sufficient with these new model classes, which entered into force in September this year, you can just make sure, okay, we already did everything we needed to do. We made the risk assessment, that's our result. Therefore, we choose this specific, specific yeah, framework and that's at least another layer of security for you. And what I'd like to recommend here too is the um, idea of just to think about a specific agreement on additional measures if you um, can agree on that, making the technical um, operational manuals and security measures just as a specific part of your contract with the ESP or customer in Europe. So, yeah, be safe when you are transferring data to countries which are not located within the European Union. Next topic is the issue of transactional emails and complying to legal frameworks or best practices. It's an ongoing topic this year. It's an ongoing topic in 2021. It's about um, queries we received to the CSA legal team, um, for instance. How often can I send remind reminders that someone is just um, using the double opt-in link? It's about what information needs to be in transactional emails, what about imprints, um, yeah, and all this stuff around here. And we thought it's really good to just have a kind of repetition why it's better not just sending them out, but to adhere to the legal requirements and to best practices that are on the market. We are thinking about double opt-in emails, we are thinking about purchase confirmations, shipping information, invoices, and something like that. And if you think about sending such emails, it's quite obvious that um, if you're sending such emails, you're using personal data. And as a reminder, if you're using personal data, you have to have a legal justification. Such legal justification can be, for instance, um, that you like to avoid the misuse of someone else's data when someone is just subscribing to a newsletter or you want to send purchase related communication, contract related communication, new terms of services, something like that. As always, it's important um, that yeah, you have the documentation of the needed justification. So the burden of proof, unfortunately, is in any case on you if you're sending an email. So you must be able to demonstrate the legal basis for sending such transactional emails as in other situations when you are sending advertising emails too. Otherwise, you might risk that you violate your personality rights and that's of course not a good idea. Beside this, there might be some legal requirements when sending transactional emails too. Looking at the European legal framework, for instance, it's about the obligation to have an imprint in any commercial communication, so this one applies to transactional emails in any case. And another thing we want to point out here is um, complying to best practices might be a good idea because of the reputation. If you're not complying to specific best practices, um, sending out transactional emails might be perceived as spam, if, for instance, if it's not initiated and someone else's data has been misused and you cannot prove where the email address has been collected. Um, it's even more perceived as than if you're sending double opt-in emails, for instance, twice or even more times, it's uh, for sure perceived as spam. And if you are just make a combination of a double opt email or an invoice with additional advertising, it for sure will be perceived as spam and that's bad for your reputation. 
And another thing I like to stress here is we saw in the past that invoices, developed in emails, other communication, which is contract related, um, was sent with the sender's name newsletter at something. So I really recommend think of the yeah the name or the email address you are using for sending such communication. Make a make a difference here. I think it's much better for the people who are receiving these emails and they really can make the difference between the contractual information that need to be sent and other emails that are advertising emails. I already mentioned the burden of proof who's or which is on the sender and that leads me to the last point from the legal review. Um, unfortunately, we have again to talk about the issue of missing permission data because we saw a lot of complaints and complaints handling procedures where in the end no information was provided to us or missing um, information where in the permission data which have been sent to us and that's on the one hand of course a legal issue but also have an impact on the other hand on your reputation so um, I just like to repeat here again, the legal situation first, the burden of proof, and I repeat myself, is on the sender. That's laid down, for instance, in Article 7 of the GDPR, but also in Article 13 of the Data Protection Directive for electronic communication. Um, so it's, yeah, it's no question here if you're in the situation that you have to defense claims, for instance, or if someone is just saying, okay, why are you sending this? It's my data. I don't want to. The burden of proof that you are allowed to send advertising emails is on you, whether you like it or not. Um, as a consequence, if you're not able to demonstrate that you are allowed to use the personal data, fines might be imposed, and it's not about just a few euros. It's a about um, several millions, which can be imposed on you or 4% of your turnover, whatever counts more. Um, so better be on the safe side, think about the documentation, make your customers aware that documentation of the permission is really important. You really need to be able to demonstrate um, this kind of data. And even if someone is asking to yeah, delete personal data, just think about the situation that you might be um, in the situation that you have to defend a legal claim even a year after. So as long as the limitation period is running, from our perspective, it's fine to keep at least this information which you need to defend a legal claim. So that was the legal perspective. Uh, coming to the reputational perspective, if you're not able to provide the permission data in case of any, yeah, let's call them legal claims or just normal complaints about sending an email. It's about loss of reputation. Loss of reputation from a user's sorry, per perspective because um, you can have a negative word of mouth. It's, it's a consequence might lead to, yeah, fewer purchases and this in the end means means less turnover for you so it's really bad um, if someone is talking to the press and giving the word of mouth not only to a friend but to people from the press it might be really negative for you from a PR perspective and um, just thinking about the CSA if you're not able to provide the permission data in case of any complaints and yeah it's not only once but three four five six times in a very short period of time this um, might lead to some publication on our website and in the really worst case scenario it might lead to a temporary exclusion of participating in the csa and we don't want that and it's so easy to have this documentation, so we really recommend you have an eye on this 
make your customers aware. And with this, um, yeah, I don't know, think about it. I really like to hand over to Sebastian, who will now talk to you about the technical topics of Sony 20. Zeb, I think that we can't hear you now. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the only one, <laughs> but I think the attendees can't hear you too. Alexander, do you hear Zeb? No? No, unfortunately not. Okay, then. Did you switch something in the settings? Because before we, no, no, we can't hear you again. I think now, just say something. Hello, can you hear me? Now we no. can hear you. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. But do you hear us? <laughs> I think Obviously so. not. I mean, 20 minutes ago it worked. Yeah, we tested it before, and we can, we could hear you and see you. So. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Now? Yes, <laughs> we can hear you, Zeb. I'm so sorry. I <laughs> no don't problem. know what happened. <laughs> I, it, I think it is somehow related to my headset. What is that? That's the last webinar this year, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, I see. It's already in Christmas mode. <laughs> Right. I'm um, sorry for that. Um, Alexandra, you jumped out of the presentation mode. So I what? only. Yes. I can only see PowerPoint in front of me rather than the presentation mode. Why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I didn't change anything. Cool, thanks. What then now, now we're... took over the control. Now we're back. Um, sorry for the interruption. Obviously very funny to have the last webinar this year. Um, now it's me and um, I'm happy to talk a little about the, yeah, top four tech topics um, this year. So uh, next to the legal stuff that kept, kept us busy, um, um, we decided to yeah pick four of the major topics um, that were discussed or that have been developed over the over this year. So I think the, 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 the most, uh, yeah, the, the loudest one this year may have been um, the Apple MPP um that was discussed in september and uh, had a big or has a big impact on um, email marketing on senders on brands um on consultants so let's take a little look on that then google bimi then csa topic certification monitor and then a little into uh the best practice standards mentioning the domain alignment um, or um, the DKIM alignment. So these are the four topics I thought would be best talking to you about when we talk about Apple MPP. MPP stands for Male Privacy Protection. Um, was, I think, the first move. I don't know if it's the final one or if it's the right solution for every single mailbox provider out there, but at least Apple started to um, do something to protect the privacy data of their users. It all started with the launch in September 2020, uh, sorry, 
2021 this year, um, where Apple announced that they will not allow to yeah track the user engagement as it was in the past. Um, the biggest impact was on tracking the open rate. So a very common technique is to track the open rates via a, an image pixel integrated in the email. And um, as this all works on loading images, um, Apple decided to yeah, somehow make the image service a little different. So providing a proxy image service rather than a direct download. And uh, this makes it more or less not no longer reliable to trust those open rate information. And um, that means many meter, meter data based on that tracking pixel can't be used in a reliable way anymore open rate is the most obvious one, but as well IP or geolocation. So services that have been developed in the past for further segmentation, also demographic, to enrich the demographic uh, segmentation, aren't um, that easy to, to use or aren't reliable anymore. And um, that's not only for um, the Apple Mail service itself, it's for every single email user that is using um, the native Apple Mail um, app and the Apple Mail services that run through uh, the infrastructure of Apple. So if I'm using Apple Mail for uh, my Gmail address, um, it has an impact on that as well. And um, that means that or that was a, a hot discussion um, amongst the, 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 the parties of the market. And um, for sure, um, it has already a broad impact, but to be honest, we do not know how far this will go. It is just the first move. And uh, yeah, if you ask me personally, I think Apple was the brave one to start with that initiative. And what it needs um, to for us to understand why Apple and I strongly believe other mailbox providers will join in the future this as well, is that Apple clearly says the user experience is our priority one. So our focus is to keep our users happy. And with all the whistle blowing, with all the data breaches, with all the uh, data leaks that we read about or maybe were challenged in the past few years, um, I think Apple made a very important decision to protect their user base because that's what users out there recognize. They do not understand the technical background of a data breach and why that happened. But what they understand is that suddenly 40 million, 50 million, 100 million data records have been published outside a database or outside a service. And that's what um, a common user recognizes. And when Apple, if you ask me for pure marketing, stands up and says, hey, we start to protect your privacy from now on, that's a good key and good thing um, to, to, yeah, build trust in their own user group. Um, it can be discussed on different ways, no question, but I think the biggest impact is, the, is that Apple picked up this trust level and I think other mailbox providers will join that and uh, that leads us to figuring out new ways of providing engagement data. That is the more or less biggest challenge in email marketing in the upcoming years as we will lose traction on um, the open rate tracking and the open rate measurement. Um, it may impact furthermore, um, but the need in email marketing is still there, that the funnel of email marketing needs to be tracked. Um, it needs to be tracked not only for, um, for, for yeah, the, the, the pure increase of income, for, for, for a brand or from, from a marketing perspective. Also to understand 
and to fulfill the expectation from the mailbox providers, please do not send any longer to unengaged customers, which is a, an ongoing discussion um, which ends up in yeah, looking at the right data and figuring out about the right engagement um, for user group, groups. And um, so this requires new ways of thinking, maybe new services that we will figure out in the future. And um, it also requires a new way of thinking in, kind, in terms of think outside the silo of email marketing and the traditional um, tracking methods. Maybe it's time to merge data and um, understand engagement, customer and user engagement in a different way and make use of it from other channels, social media, um, uh, commercial, so basket information on all this kind of stuff and really include this and make much more use out of it, uh, out of it than uh, we did bef um, that, like we did until now. Um, let's try, is it working? Hopefully. Yeah. Um, coming to the next topic that has been discussed and was very interesting from a security standpoint from, and from a, from a standards standpoint was um, the official announcement of Google um, making use of Bimi and supporting Bimi. Um, it was launched in July 2020, where Google joined the BIMI group and officially said, okay, um, we will enable BIMI in our inbox. Um, it, Google was the first one who really um, pushed on the use of verified mark certificates. So you can't make of you can't make uh, use of of Google Beamy when you don't have such a certificate. And um, two providers um, joined and said, "Hey, yeah, we will uh, provide that service and uh, we will make it happen." And the motivation of Google um, to integrate and to support Beamy is further to push the DMARC adoption based on the learnings of a case study that Google and uh, the Stanford University in, uh, in the US figure out by analyzing data from, I think, April to August last year, where they said, uh, where they figured out that phishing um, increased and was a kind of follow-up effect on large data breach, uh, breaches that uh, happened before. So all the data that, that, that were leaked and published into the market became, um, yeah, or were used for, for phishing attempts. And um, that's kind of motivation where uh, Google started, okay, we need to find that, we need to fight against that, we need to protect our users, there we have it again, it's protection, it's, it's protect the privacy of their users. Um, and um, Google wants to push the DMARC adoption. And the goody and the benefit of a clear DMARC setting and um, DMARC adoption from a sender is to get the BIMI logo um, displayed in the inbox at Gmail. And um, I think what um, oh, important information here is you are you will find various information on the Google support for Beamy. Um, I think we're sending around the the, um, um, the the presentation afterwards, so it's linked here. Um, it's a pretty good instruction and um, postmaster website that Google um, published. You can find the principles how BIMI works and what needs to be done on the BIMI group for sure. And um, as I've mentioned that the verified uh, mark certificate are required for, you, uh, for um, Google BIMI and Trust and DigiCert are the two certification companies 
um, who will um, who work on that and then will give you uh, or are managing those certificates for um, the Google Beamy integration. Jumping just to the next topic, um, important for us in particular this year was the launch of the certification monitor in July. Um, I don't know why I'm still in 2020, um, even if we're already looking forward into 2022. Um, so we launched it this year in July 2021. Um, and it is the monitoring tool for deliverability. The goal was to create transparency for our CSA clients. So providing feedback, data feedback from our mailbox provider partners to the ESPs related to the CSA criteria. Um, it is basically data information based on IP or DKIM, but this enables ESPs to mitigate, to research, or to investigate deliverability issues. Um, when I mentioned it's closed, re closely related to the CSA criteria, we're talking about spam complaint threshold in particular, which is at the level of 0.3% um, maximum. We require that every single email needs to be DKIM signed. So every, every email that creates a DKIM error while the validation happens or isn't signed at all um, is important to get to know. And um, for example, some feedback of, of our senders was with just knowing that there is at a specific IP or as a specific DKIM, there is an error or there are errors while sending, helped us already to figure out what's wrong, DNS setup, or at the very early start, we also figured out that um, Open DKIM um, had an implement implementation uh, failure and caused some issues. Um, so important information, to know about the environment, the email environment, um, to make the whole traffic better. And um, we monitor that and the monitoring tool enables you as an ESP um, to monitor the data and make use of that data. We've got several partners that work together with us um, to, to push data into our system which is um, one and one, including gmxwebdemail.com. It is Yahoo, which includes AOL as well. It is Swisscom, it is Abusix, it is Colilox, um, and all those partners provide us with different data um, that we normalize and pull together to provide it to you as a, yeah, in a nutshell report. And these are, just screenshots from the tool that you can look, log in web-based that gives you a brief overview about the CSA compliance status and a further drill down if you click into certain areas to monitor your spam complaint trend, your DKIM errors trend, your spam traps trend. And um, I recommend to every ESP to um, log into that tool, to make use of that tool, aside to the automated um, Open API service that we um, built as well, or that we provide as well, um, which is the background for that tool. And last but not least, is it working? Yes. Um, no, that's too far. Can you click that? Is it working? Yes. Um, last but not least, I would love to talk about a little more about domain alignment or especially DKIM alignment. Was a topic brought up earlier this year, um, round about April, there was um, at some day a hot discussion starting um about alignment of uh, certain domains in an email header i think that was initiated by 
um, a first move of T online, where they start, where they said um, throughout the year we will start filtering based on domains, um, and domains that are not aligned will not make it into our system. And um, that initiated a hot discussion not only among senders as well amongst the mailbox providers. Um, where they for sure, or where they discussed what is best, how should we manage that. Um, there were certain different opinions about how should we implement that. Is it closely related to the DMARC standard? Is it something different or whatever? Um, apart from oh, this discussion is still ongoing and um, there is no final result um, out of it. The principal idea about that is aligning domains used in an email. As we all know, an email can include many different domains. The mail from, the header from, the deacon domain, the link domain, the image domain, the, re the reply use domain, the whatever domain. So we've got several different positions within an email where you can use different domains. It doesn't make sense to use that many domains. And um, the question for the mailbox provider is, who's owning that domain? And who's responsible for the content or for the images? Or who sent that email? And who's the brand behind? All those questions are important to be answered for the mailbox provider. And um, the alignment for certain domains um, is discussed to yeah create and outline different responsibilities throughout the whole sending process. An ESP is just a technical provider, so you are just providing the technical platform to enable uh, to to enable mass email broadcasting, mass email sending. But the data quality and the email content and email strategy, that's either not 100% in your control, but it is at least not your responsibility. Um, as Alexandra already mentioned, it is the sender's burden, but who's the sender? You can define it in, in, in different ways. The technical sender is the ESP, but not responsible for the consent, for the permission, for the content, and for the context to send an email. That's the brand. And um, if we look at an email header, there are different positions where the two different major parties um, are mentioned. It is the sender and it is the sending platform. And this needs to be addressed. And the idea is, and I try to uh, explain it from our uh, perspective, so from the CSA perspective, um, that will lead into a new criteria that we want to achieve and want to see an alignment for at least the 5322 from, which is the seen header from, and the 50, 5321 from domain, which is the mail from. And ideally, those are signed in a relaxed way by a DKIM signature um, or a strict way by a DKIM signature, which makes sure that um, we, on the one hand, have the ESP providing the host, the pure software for do the sending, which is this is the IP, this is the host. Um, and um, but the responsibility for the strategy, either the user feels spammed or not, is related to the brand. And that's why um, we are recommending um, this alignment that um, there is no chance in the future for, yeah, brands to cover themselves behind the curtain of an ESP and sending out spammy, spammy campaigns. With this obvious Deakin signature, um, 
we expect more transparency and the responsibility when it comes to high complaint rates for a certain campaign from a certain brand that we um, can reach out from our side or the mailbox provider as well to both parties, to the ESP and to the brand directly to um, investigate and yeah, mitigate the issue of, um, of, of spam complaints. And um, yeah, that's in a nutshell how we picked this topic up. It is an ongoing discussion and um, I'm pretty sure even with that um, kickstart this year, um, initiated somehow by T-Online, we will see further progress throughout the whole next year and it will be picked up by many mailbox providers, I'm 100% sure. And um, the CSA criteria is already or will already pick it up um, very soon to uh, make this yeah, a progress in terms of developing standards um, and supporting standards for the market. That was the quick overview to the four tech topics that we found most important this year. And um, now I think we're happy for questions um, or comments. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, first of all. Um, so far we have uh, some questions. I think I will read them out loud. And dear Tennis, if you want to ask, just raise your hand and ask your question live. But um, the first question uh, for Sebastian, do you know whether more ESPs will follow Apple's mail privacy protection? Not yet. Um, I don't know from any mailbox providers talk um, that they will talk uh, directly, but it made them thinking about um, the user protection and uh, tracking limitation, that's for sure. Um, but none of them, what I heard and know so far, uh, is really planning any similar action for now. But okay. I'm not sure if they share everything with me. They don't need to, <laughs> so <laughs> it can still be a secret. Um, the next one. Um, what do you suggest for senders how to track engagement in the future? That's a good question, and I think <laughs> was a kind of provocation when I when I brought up the point. Think about new ways. So um, we heard it throughout the year um, already in webinars from uh, Marcel Becker from Yahoo, for example. And uh, Marcel is a good example, and Yahoo is a good example. Um, even though we thought that open rate tracking. Oh, even though the open rate tracking in the common way is is, is very natural to, to all email marketing providers, um, it doesn't 100% mirror the understanding of engagement that a mailbox provider has. So the mailbox provider completely, thinks completely differently uh, in terms of engagement. And um, I think um, oh, what we already have is that, for example, Yahoo provides engagement data in a certain data feed, different types of engagement uh, data that is already in, uh, uh, available. And I think that's that, that's something that I used to work with in the past already. Um, and I think that will be the future um, as well, that this data and maybe new data um, standards will turn out or need to turn out uh, where we work um, together. And for sure, what you sh still should include is the so-called web-based tracking. So rather than just having the click from the email onto the landing page following the funnel. So incorporate that, incorporate that data as well. And engagement with a brand does not only mean clicking and opening. It's also if you've got um, a, a closed user area how often do they log in? How often do they make use of it? That's also kind of engagement level that you can track and can make use of. And uh, you can somehow transfer those insights or indications into the activity of email marketing. So when, uh, for example, a user didn't log into your platform for two years and didn't buy anything the past, uh, the, the past two years, how likely is it that it's still a highly engaged email marketing user? So those are the the the, the indications and, and insights I would use personally um, 
to make use of different data types. Okay, then a question for Alexandra. Um, what exactly do senders need to show in order to prove an opt-in? Which information do you exactly require? Okay, um, coming a little to the detailed uh, stuff about documentation, burden of proof and that such things. Um, we take the easy way, opt-in meaning a consent, an active declaration that someone is really wanting to receive a newsletter or, or other advertising emails. It's about um, the declaration itself. It's about dates when the opt-in has been given, so date, time. It's about the source of the declaration, meaning is it a website where someone was just clicking, okay, I really like to subscribe to a newsletter, or was it um, something during other activities, even in the offline world, someone can just make, um, yeah, in writing a declaration or something like that. That needs to be covered in the um, opt-in information, permission information. That's the relevant stuff. Of course, the email address, that's the important thing. Yeah, and the best way to do so is, of course, the double opt-in process, because if you are putting all the information on the double opt-in email, you have a second layer of um, documentation here. And then you can be on a relatively secure side of things that the person who just gave the yes, I like to, also just confirmed, okay, it's me, it's my email address, and I really like to give the declaration that's mentioned in the download an email. Okay, then we have the last question for Sebastian. Mm, uh, sorry. You showed two examples of the main alignment. Which one do you think is the more likely to become a requirement? Um, that's a good question. I don't know how it ends up. We will start with, can I go back? I'm not sure. Um, with um, the easiest one, which is a relaxed DKIM alignment um, between a between a DKIM signature and the 5322 header from domain. <clears throat> so um, that still, uh, that, that already provides the transparency that there is responsibility from the sending brand to the content um, and to the, to the whole email. Um, I don't know how fast and when it will develop, but I can clearly see that um, we uh, will move into the inclusion of the mail from header itself. Um, that's why we start with the kind of first iteration um, of this DKIM, uh, um, DKIM, I call it DKIM alignment. Um, and uh, so we want to start consequent adoption of this alignment topic but in the first step we want to make it as easy as possible for the ESPs to jump in and start with but I can see a, a clear acceleration of that development throughout the years throughout the next year and 2023 um, I'm not sure but the first example on um, the relaxed alignment uh, would be a good start um, because discussions with mailbox providers turned out that it's absolutely fine for them if a brand signs with their main domain on an org level, um, because every single subdomain underneath is automatically related to that main domain, um, and that's fine. Then. My personal opinion is a different one, but yeah, <laughs> I'm more strict and more consequent on that. Than Relax one. Yes, you are. <laughs> but, uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexander and Sebastian, for the webinar today. Thank you, attendees, for joining us today. 
This was the last webinar of this year. We will start another series next year again. So um, yeah, thank you for joining us and we wish you all the best for the rest of the year, of course, for next year too. Stay healthy and uh, hopefully we can see us next year again. And yeah, thank you again, Sebastian and Alexander, that you did the last webinar with me this year. And um, yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.